Good evening. My name is Lisa Barbash. I'm the curator of visual anthropology at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, located on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. I'm very delighted to welcome you all to Manifest 13 Colonies, a lecture and conversation about a very special photographic project. This event is presented by the Peabody Museum in collaboration with the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. It is made possible by the Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography, which is annually awarded by the Peabody Museum and funds an established practitioner of the photographic arts to create and subsequently publish through the Peabody Museum, a major book of photographs on the human condition anywhere in the world. Among the previous fellows are Dianita Singh, Ito Barada, Deborah Luster, Guy Tillam, and Sami Baloji. Robert Gardner, 1925 to 2014, had a long and fruitful relationship with, the, with Harvard and the Peabody Museum, and he was co-founder of Harvard's Film Study Center, who was a brilliant and influential ethnographic filmmaker. Among his works are Dead Birds, made in New Guinea in 1963, and Forest of Bliss, made in India in 1986. He was also the author of many books, some of which were published by the Peabody Museum Press. Wendell White is the 14th recipient of the Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography. He has taught at the School of Visual Arts, the International Center for Photography, Rochester Institute of Technology, and he is currently Distinguished Professor of Art and American Studies at Stockton University. He is the recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship in Photography, as well as having artist fellowships from the New Jersey State Council for the Arts and other awards. His work is represented in many museums and corporate collections, including Duke University, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and the New York Public Library, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, New York. Wendell White describes himself as delving into archives, museums, and libraries in order to, and I quote, excavate Black history through material culture. He photographs diaries, documents, musical instruments, tape recorders, doors, hair, photographs, souvenirs, and other artifacts. White says that the ability of objects to transcend lives, centuries, and millennia suggests a remarkable mechanism for folding time, bringing the past and the present into a shared space that is uniquely suited to artistic exploration. These artifacts are the forensic evidence of Black life and, life and events in the United States. Wendell's photographs, he says, are a response to the collective physical remnants of the American concept and representation of race. Tonight, Wendell White will share some of his recent work, and then he will get, engage in a conversation with Brenda Tyndall, public historian and executive director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. We also welcome your participation. So will you please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions or comments anytime during the program. Our speakers will address as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Wendell White to the Zoom stage. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And before I begin sharing work and talking about my work, I want to say how much I appreciate the support of the Peabody, Peabody Museum and all, everyone there, um, all of the efforts, especially on the part of Lisa to, um, you know, get me onboarded for the fellowship and everything. And so it's really been quite um, a pleasure to be working with uh, the Peabody, and I'm looking forward to my conversation with Dr. Tyndall. We have had previous conversations, and I'm looking forward to continuing that uh, for the audience. So as you've heard already, the title of this presentation is Manifest 13 Colonies, and it is primarily concerned with African-American material culture in the archive in the various, uh, in various forms, libraries, um, museums, 
historical um, societies and in private collections as well. This project, and I just um, in particular want to talk a little bit about its origins, um, as well as the scope of the of the project and the project, by the way, the 13 colonies hopefully is um, evident in terms of thinking about the geographic scope of the project. I am including specifically work from collections and archives in what were the 13 original English colonies um, as part of this particular project for a long time. This project has been tied to geography and I've con and I've decided to continue that relationship between geography and the landscape with the still life objects, the still life photographs that I'm making in these various collections. This this book, this photograph of this book is a the first book that was purchased after becoming free of slavery by um, Frederick Douglass. It's in the um, special collection at the University of Rochester. And in addition to this, this um, image is the, a lock of Frederick Douglass's hair also in that special collection. These are the first two photographs that I made as part of what eventually became a series of projects related to the manifest theme in terms of building a collection and building an archive and building a reliquary in a sense of these different objects related to different parts of the country and the geography of the place of African Americans in the American landscape. And as I've worked on other projects that were more specifically connected in that way, this one ties this a little bit more specifically to the way in which these projects come together. I, this is a and one of many uh, documents that I have photographed. It's a bill of sale for a slave. It's from, a, from the collection at Duke University. And I started with this because I wanted to also uh, tie the work that I've been doing to the way in which all of this has emerged. For me, it emerged as a type of uh, artistic um, intellectual inquiry, um, but with an emphasis on an, a relationship to the humanities and a relationship to um, humanities ideas. I um, have been uh, often spoken of the fact that the, my uh, current academic position at Stockton University has been one that really broadened my involvement with the humanities um, in various ways through uh, my colleagues and through various programs at the institution. Along the way, I also wound up serving on the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, which I was very excited to do, and many conversations with um, people involved in, in that organization have shaped a lot of the ideas over uh, several decades that have had an impact on this work. Very recently, though, I was struck by two paragraphs in Isabel Wilkerson's uh, book, Cast, about America and the way it connects to the work that I've been doing. And I'm always looking for these connections. America is an old house. We can never declare the work over. Wind, flood, drought, and human upheavals batter a structure that is already fighting whatever flaws were left unattended in the original foundation. When you live in an old house, you may not want to go into the basement after a storm to see what the rains have wrought. Choose not to look, however, at your own peril. The owner of an old house knows that whatever you are ignoring will never go away. Whatever is lurking will fester whether you choose to look or not. Ignorance is, not, is no protection from the consequences of inaction. And ideas like this and others have been very much um, at the center of my motivation and how I have been tying work together that is both uh, work that is about uh, tremendous pain and terror that has occurred in the Af to the African American communities in this country for a long period of time, but then also a transcendent transcendence which has taken place within the community, a sense of agency and a sense of uh, accomplishment uh, in spite of obstacles uh, placed in the way. This was something that opened up a set of ideas for me that I 
um, was that was very important. It's almost impossible to tell in this context what this document is, but it follows the bill of sale in a way that's perfectly natural and in a way that I had never thought of, which is that it is an insurance policy on the on the slave that was purchased. This idea of property is never more um, prevalent than the notion that um, you know, somebody who has a business will insure their property in that regard. And this is an insurance policy for the slave based on a cost that was paid and that would be paid out. What I also found interesting about this and which has been part of the work that I've been doing in general is the way this transcends North and South. So while this document sits at the Duke uh, University uh, collection um, in the Rubenstein Library, it refers to an insurance policy um, for from a Connecticut insurance company. So everybody was involved in this process. And I come across these uh, images. This is a, a book of um, kind of a uh, memento book of photographs of well-known people. It comes from the Kraft family in uh, South Carolina. This is an image of Frederick Douglass. And as you can see, the photographs that I make include and exclude parts of the information. None of these photographs are intended to be illustrations of the objects. They're really intended to be representations of, of the experience that I've uh, encountered as I move from one uh, collection to another. Um, I, it, will, it would take up all of the time that I have today, and I will probably run out of time anyway, um, to go into the individual details. This is now I'm at the um, Library of Virginia. And um, this is another uh, book that was in the collection at um, Duke University, kind of. And so these are going back and forth. They're not organized around the collection. And gradually, you'll see they're organized a little bit around some ideas and themes that emerge. The challenge has been for me that so many different um, ideas emerge as I encounter the materials that I look at, and I don't have a particular limit on the types of materials that I look at. And I am looking at whatever I can gain access to from the earliest arrival of Africans in North America as part of the process of enslavement all the way to the current moment. And so uh, some of the images that I have photographed are very contemporary um, in terms of their production. Obviously, uh, many museums and collections uh, and libraries are you know, have to catch up with uh, contemporary uh, events in terms of gaining access to and collecting those objects. This is, for me, particularly interesting because it also marks a, a representation of an early moment in this process. Um, and this is a recent photograph that I made. It's a, um, a autograph page of Albion Tourget. And the whole story of Albion Tourget was one that was really quite potent uh, early in this process and really had a lot to do with sort of driving the way in which this um, project has, has unfolded over time. I actually um, was upstate New York working on um, some photographs in different collections and Mark Elliott, who is a um, scholar, he was in uh, North Carolina, I think he may still be in North Carolina, was visiting with his new book and, and giving a book talk about his book, Colorblind Justice. Um, and I thought I would read a portion of it because it, it, was, it is a book that has had a tremendous impact for me. In the spring of 1902, a package arrived at the United States Consulate in Bordeaux, France, containing a complimentary copy of The Leopard Spots, a romance of the white man's burden by Thomas Dixon, Jr. Walter Hines Page, the prominent publisher who had personally arranged the, for the publication of The Leopard Spots at Doubleday, Page and Company, probably sent the volume believing that the American consul in Bordeaux would find the subject matter of great interest. If so, Page was not alone in this assumption. More copies of Dixon's first novel were sent to Albion Tourget by friends and foes alike. Responding in a 38-page typewritten letter composed in short stints over several weeks, he gave full expression to his feelings 
the extraordinary letter reveals the depths of Tourget's ideological distance from both Dixon, the Southern extremist, and from Northern liberals. And then this is not uh, the Leopard Spots, it's a cover, it's the Klansman, uh, the Thomas Dixon book that becomes uh, birth of, uh, that inspires Birth of a Nation. This long letter gave, and then the text continues in Colorblind Justice, this long letter gave Tourget an opportunity to reflect upon the crusade for social justice to which he had devoted his career. By 1902, he had become a voice from the political wilderness, and no one knew it better than himself. He had once believed that the Civil War had set the country upon a course of humanitarian enlightenment and moral progress. Recalling the idealism of his war days, he remembered his joy at the mere call to, over, to the overthrow of slavery, which had removed that stain of injustice and oppression on his country. Emancipation, he had believed, had made the United States truly the flower of liberty, security, and equal rights for all. But somehow the true spirit of the crusade against slavery had been afterwards forgotten. We had made the name of slavery an anathema, he told Johnson, but we have sanctified its most degrading and debasing element, the subjugation of one race to another. And it's all of these ideas sort of swirling around that I find uh, to be remarkable. I know probably most of you are familiar, but I will just make the additional note that Albion Tourget was the losing attorney in Plessy v. Ferguson, which then ushered in, this is why he's in the political wilderness, it then ushers in the Jim Crow era. Um, this is a voting box uh, in North Carolina, and some objects, and as we looked at a couple right now, may not have come directly in contact with African Americans or created by African Americans, but they all evoke the narratives that have been central to our lives uh, for all the time um, that uh, we have been in the United States and the complexity of what it means to be an American um, in, in this um, country. Uh, the definition of that, how that definition unfolds. This is a, a wonderful piece of pottery from an archeological dig in Long Island uh, being done by the Department of uh, Anthropology at Montclair. Uh, university. This is an image I actually posted fairly recently. It's an eel spear um, uh, gig, I guess it's called, um, that is used for um, fishing or fishing for eel. And uh, Chris Matthews, who is the acting chair of the department there, was one who invited me to be able to photograph some of this active archaeological work that they were doing um, in Setauket, Long Island. And in our conversations, he brought up this painting um, by William Sidney Mount, which I thought I would just share, which is um, uh, eel spearing at Setauket. So this is a painting depicting the landscape and uh, the process of eel spearing, including uh, the presence of an African-American woman um, in that process of, of uh, fishing at actually the sound in near Sato it, it, at Setauket um, in Long Island, New York. So this is a remarkable, um, you know, object that then connects to this his historical painting that, in a remarkable way. Um, this one was uh, an object photographed, again, connected to fishing. And so there are all of these different threads that I encounter and try sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to weave into the narrative. And so this is a, a, um, a basket uh, from in Georgia the, of, uh, for carrying fish after, um, you know, catching fish. Um, uh, so the, the catch would go into there and it's hand woven. Um, we started at the beginning with a lock of Frederick Douglass's hair. Hair has been something I don't have a lot of them in today's um, slide presentation, but it's something that I have been continually interested in. Um, this is at North Carolina Museum of History. Um, this is was from a private collection of um, by, of my friend, actually Vicky Gold Levy, um, and it comes from a beauty product line that was uh, produced in Atlantic City, New Jersey, not too far from uh, where I live. And I believe these objects have gone on to um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And this is another one of the Apex products 
uh, from Atlantic City. Again, hair related products. Here is a brogan, handmade brogan that was um, in the collection in North Carolina. And so these ordinary quotidian kinds of objects, handmade clothing, um, are essential um, to the broader story. So we see some remarkable um, objects, the documentation of humans owning other humans, and then the ordinary everyday objects. And it's that meshing together of all of these um, different ways of thinking about race, thinking about um, the American definition of race, the American definition of, you know, um, the uh, absorption into the American um, nation, into the ideal, uh, so to speak, that is played out, James Baldwin's Inkwell. Um, Blind Tom, uh, Thomas Whaley, Thomas Whaley, I think, um, this is in the National Museum, um, flute um, in um, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Musical instruments. This is probably today, I think, maybe the most contemporary thing that I'm showing. And this is a door from Katrina. Malcolm X's tape recorder from um, the mosque, number seven. And this is um, a broken glass. It was part of uh, several photographs that I made of objects that were removed from what had been Paul Robeson's house in Princeton as part of their uh, process of renovating that and um, trying to um, create a center there uh, for Paul Robeson. These are some, and there are really ordinary everyday uh, objects, a pouch that held smoking tobacco. This is uh, from the um, Harriet Beecher Stowe Center uh, in Hartford, which is, I got a chance to spend a couple days there, and really um, a remarkable collection of material related to not only the Stowe family and Harriet Beecher Stowe, but to specifically the Uncle Tom narrative. Um, I believe, if I remember it correctly, they have some 2,000 unique editions of, the, uh, of Uncle Tom's Cabin, along with a range of other um, publications related to it. And in this particular case, um, objects related to Uncle Tom's Cabin, these are Staffordshire uh, or Staffordshire-like ceramics um, of uh, Tom. This is um, on the, in the scientific end. This is from the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. This is a piece of intestines that was um, used to determine um, the, one of the first um, strains of cholera. This particular um, specimen has been written about. It came from a man of African descent in 1849 uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, these are objects in the collection. Um, to my recollection, they don't have much of a um, provenance about this. Many of the objects in their collection were uh, provided as teaching uh, material by various faculty. And so they were just placed and then removed from time to time for teaching purposes before it became more formalized as a museum in that regard. Um, and this is, um, and there's no indication that this bone is connected to an African American, but it is a bone that was um, uh, removed as a result of a wound during the Civil War. So it connects to that narrative in the largest possible way. I'm running out of time. I love these um, uh, offset plates. They're in the um, Pusey Library, the uh, Harvard Archives. These are wonderful representations. This is um, uh, not no longer at Harvard. This is um, in um, Charleston. This is back at Harvard, um, and we'll, it's a long conversation, so I'll, we'll get back to that. But this is one of my favorite things, and one of the things that Lisa mentioned to me early on that she thought I might be interested in, and um, uh, Carolyn Bonday's um, dissert thesis um, about uh, 
race and the mixing of race between African American and white, so all most of these people, and then using hair as a specimen in within that regard. Um, so that's I think a presentation in and of itself. Um, portraits from Asbury, New Jersey. Uh, a silhouette at the um, Stowe Center in Hartford. Can go quickly. Some of this is self-evident. I wanted to um, then also quickly include a couple of more places. This is another early, this is, uh, that's um, Alina Horn. Um, this is a, another early, um, and this is, uh, that's at Virginia Union University, um, piece that was quite influential for me. It came from a catalog by Coco Fusco and Brian Wallace uh, and an exhibition uh, for an exhibition at the um, Whitney Museum entitled um, Only Skin Deep. And the, this little passage near the very end of their essay, nonetheless, race remains with us as a very compelling myth. It is part of our American heritage. It has been one of the most important and powerful means of determining who is and who is not considered American. Photography has been the most effective form of image making for both supporting and debunking, debunking the myth of race. And I'll um, sort of skip a couple of uh, pieces here that I had wanted to um, write about this, and just so that I can talk for a minute about this, uh, these last pieces. These are just a few of the cases in which the Zeely daguerreotypes, the photographs made of enslaved people during slavery, and that's also um, one of the things that's um, specific and they were commissioned. And so all of them are, and there are a number, there's a wonderful um, new book in which um, the Peabody collaborated with uh, Deborah Willis and others to um, write about this work as well as other uh, forms of representation of African Americans. Um, I, and of course, Carrie Mae Weems made a series of really well-known images of these um, daguerreotypes. And I just wanted, oops, there we go. I just wanted to, um, in a sense, look at them as objects and close them off. I didn't want to uh, see them again um, in terms of their faces. Um, it's a, it, and it, it's one way, I mean, I often look very directly at painful content, but this was one way that I could look at some painful content and uh, find a way to um, provide some comfort in recognizing the pain that's involved. So um, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Brenda Tendall to come and join a conversation with me. Thank and welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, Wendell. I am just um, impressed um, as usual uh, with your work and with your ability to articulate your vision um, for uh, the um, artifacts and the material culture uh, that make up Manifest uh, 13 Colonies. You know, it's it's interesting because um, a few years ago, I was um, a project uh, archivist on the Alice Walker collection at uh, Emory University. And while I was uh, working on that collection, I ran across a sticky note uh, written in her long hand. Um, and that sticky note read, people are known by the records they keep. If it isn't in the record, it will be said that it did not happen. Mm -hmm. That is what history is, a keeping of. And I kept, that kept sort of coming to the surface as I was, um, you know, sitting at your feet during this presentation. Um, and it has certainly been a guidepost in many ways for my own thinking as a historian um, and as a steward of uh, sort of diverse biocultural collections. And so I, I leverage uh, that uh, sort of encounter, if you will, in Alice Walker's uh, collection to, to begin our conversation 
I'm wondering, uh, you know, in your opinion, what is the utility of keeping records? You know, what influenced your decision uh, in many ways to document Black life and culture as it found expression in private collections, archives, uh, and repositories throughout the United States? Absolutely. And thank you so much for those kind words. And I know that we have uh, also discussed the possibility of sharing some more images with folks. And so I'm going to just start that. I think that's really a critical piece of this process because it is, um, as um, one of the um, important and inspiring responses to my work that I skipped over um, for time is one from uh, the scholar Lee Rayford in which she talks about the way in which memory has not, the historical record has not been in place for African Americans in the way that it has been in place uh, for the broader um, American population. And so what we have passed on in memory has not often existed in the collections, has not often existed in the archives. And um, it's, it's been an interesting part of what has been, I would say, a complex journey as I have traveled through different collections and different archives. And um, I have to say, <clears throat> almost universally, I have had um, great uh, access and um, uh, to material in the collections. Um, I, I think, though, that the often sometimes the access that I've had has been based on the fact that the objects themselves haven't often been considered particularly rare, um, have not been considered particularly important. Um, and um, not that I'm not trustworthy, I am, but <laughs> it is also the type of thing that um, I would have expected greater obstacles um, to access early material. And so, for instance, my first um, experience, which was to, you know, just sort of have placed on the table in front of me a lock of Frederick Douglass's hair and the first book that he purchased after he became free of slavery, which in particular is inscribed by Douglass to his son with that story. So it feels very much um, like a very uh, particularly authentic piece. Um, just uh, is, was, was to me remarkable. I felt like the level of access that I was um, connecting to history was remarkable for me. And that's what's kept me. I mean, I, every day is trying to, you know, recreate that experience. <laughs> Thinking, you know, so often, um, you know, it's really, it, particularly in museums, because things are on display, there is a focus on sort of the iconicity um, mm -hmm. of, uh, of a collection or an object. And I did wonder, how did you balance, um, you know, sort of what could be understood as that quotidian um, sort of the pedestrian contours of Black life and culture with ones that maybe express a bit more iconicity. How did you make those decisions? How did you determine what would, you know, ultimately become part of this collection? Right. So that's what really distinguishes what my work from that of a, of a real historian, <laughs> of a historian in the sense that I'm really looking for a range of experiences that become the sum total of the object. And I'm looking for the degree to which there might be a certain amount of rarity, but it also might be the most common thing that I could find in every collection all over the country. But I'm also um, working as a visual artist. So I'm looking for the way in which the object resonates for me visually and how I might handle it. And the number of things that impact on that are tremendous. The environment where it's located, even though every object is placed on black velvet, the environment, the room that it's in has an impact on the appearance of the object, what it looks like. Um, a range of different things, uh, you know, uh, play out. And of course, what has happened to it in history, how it has survived its journey to that moment. So, um, you know, a jump rope in one collection look, is going to look very different than a jump rope in another collection. And 
one may be evocative of a whole range of different things that the other one um, just doesn't seem to um, connect. And it's the point that I work on in terms of communicating with archivists, librarians, um, curators, et cetera, the, whoever the gatekeepers may be for collections, when um, you know they're asking me, well, in addition to sort of finding things in the finding aid and wanting to you know have a collaborative conversation and also planning for my visit, you know, what are you looking for? And the, it's a very hard question for me to answer because it because it's not an illustration, because it's not purely about, the historical narrative that's attached to that particular object, because it's also about the visual. I often don't know until I'm sitting in front of the object, and I often even then don't know until I've made a photograph and begun to think about, you know, how it might look or how it might appear um, in a photograph. I've often been surprised by things that didn't seem exciting to me at the moment that I was sitting there, and then the photograph you know, came alive, it was wonderful. And other times I thought, oh, this is going to be the greatest, you know, photograph that I've ever made. And it winds up, you know, um, pushed to the side because it just didn't, you know, connect um, in, in various terms visually. So I really often have, ref I refer to the work that the photographing is the research, right? So I don't, it's mm -hmm. not that the photograph is an illustration for the research, it is the photograph. Photograph is the research, although I make photographs as the outcome of, you know, gathering ideas, gathering ideas, you know, from a broad range of the humanities, which hopefully tried to touch upon in terms of um, referencing some of the literature that, you know, has been um, a touchstone for me, I'll say. Absolutely. It's so interesting because, you know, so often the the story, the narrative um, of African Americans uh, can often be seen through this very monolithic lens. And, and on top of that, there is this tendency to chart um, African American experiences through a very narrow corridor from slavery to segregation to civil rights. And I'm wondering if your if the lens through which you've used um, both photography and archives challenge um, this narrow articulation of Black experiences. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you know, there's an, an entire life of Africans that are free people of color in the United States, even in the South, um, in the antebellum period of time, um, going back very early in the history of the United States. And so it is important to um, recognize that. It's also important to recognize all the other remarkably complex ways in which we have dealt with the constraints placed upon us. So, I mean, I just have an exhibition up now of work that I've done on uh, the remains of uh, what were segregated schools in the North. And, and I, we had a, an event and I met some folks. And one of the things in this particular area was that there was a, a school, a black school was created by the black community, not because this, their, this, their children were excluded from the predominant school system that was mostly white, but because they were interested in creating a job for a black teacher. And there wasn't a job for a black teacher at the at the white school so the students weren't being excluded so this is another way in which there's a tremendous amount of black agency it's not just that every colored school so to speak was the result of the dominant society excluding black students from the better schools it's there were other kinds of stories and i started that project because i came across what was a white school in a black town because there was a small population, uh, white population in this white, in this black town and segregation required that the black town build and hire a white teacher for these white students. And so then I thought, well, isn't this another remarkably complicated way in which we are thinking about, you know, race? I mean, you know, it really was a very much an apartheid moment, but at the same time, the black school was the better school, you know, the white students were in this one room schoolhouse. And so it, it was also that irony of like, no, I'll just take the, 
terrible school over here as long as I don't have to sit in the same classroom with black students. Schools segregated by classrooms, you know, there's a black classroom is downstairs, the white classroom is upstairs. That was enough to satisfy that idea. And then, of course, all the other, you know, um, things that I've encountered, the, the, the businesses, I just spent a good amount of time photographing uh, cemetery books from the civic organizations, black civic organizations that were formed to make sure that everybody in the community got a proper burial and the record keeping, the detailed record keeping that was being done um, in that in that process of, you know, taking care of everybody in the community. So they're just remarkable things. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier around, you know, sort of charting um, uh, Black life and culture um, through uh, a, a more nuanced lens, not just thinking about the pain and the horror, but also the ingenuity and the agency and the entrepreneurial spirit um, and, and a sense of um, community building and institution building um, that finds expression in the material culture. Yeah. I think yeah. what else, oh, yes, go ahead. I, was, I just was very quickly going to say it, it's, it helps me go to collections all the time, knowing <laughs> that I'm not going to only see painful stuff all day, right? Because at the end of the day, a day of painful material is exhausting. I mean, I mean, in a way that, you know, just I'm, I'm, I've had it. But the, the, the possibility for, you know, all of these wonderful things coming across material from, you know, Paul Robeson or somebody, you know, all this other stuff is just great. You know, it, uh, it helps lift me up. I was thinking about something that um, scholar Lee Rayford um, said about Manifest, um, and she wrote, Wendell White makes historical objects intimate and singular. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but see that, you know, in, you know, the, the it came into such sharp, sharp, sharp uh, expression in the context of the, the portfolio here. And, and I'm wondering, um, in, in some ways, you know, how there's a singularity and yet we might understand these objects as being quite prismatic. And so I think, for instance, of the, um, the Clark dolls. Yes. You know, one might understand those as, you know, <laughs> simply children's um, play, right? Mm -hmm. and at the same time, it defined... Um, it was critical to this critical moment, this watershed moment in American, not just Black uh, history, mm -hmm. but American history with Brown v. Board of Education. And so this uncanny ability to use your lens, your photographs as a way to, to, to pull people in to make Black life and culture uh, intimate, and yet mm -hmm. it be so prismatic is mm -hmm. so interesting. What stories do these individual and yet collectivities tell us? What, what stories do they tell us? All right. I mean, I, I think that first, and I mean, as we were already starting to touch on this idea of the way in which, you know, race has been throughout the history of this country and outside this country, but certainly in, within this country, which is where my concerns have been a remarkably complex and um, difficult uh, process that unfolds. And it, but, but what's remarkable about it is that it never seems to quite go the way things are planned. You know, it, it, it seems as though these plans have been laid and it always um, is, is more nuanced than the than than the simple um, uh, notion that um, there is a continuum of starting things start out bad and then they get better <laughs> you know, that, that, that's you know the nicer story that we would like to that we would like to you know tell but the fact of the matter is that early in the history of this country, there were people that had a tremendous amount of agency. And today, there are a tremendous number of people that don't have any agency at all, all based on the, the construction around race, around appearance. And this is, 
you know, goes back to, you know, I have to go back to Wilkerson and, and her idea of caste, which is that this was the, the, the remarkably powerful thing that was different about race, about caste in America is that it was race-based as opposed to simply like, oh, you were born to this family or you come from this tribe over here or you are, you know, in this situation in the United States, caste, where you sit in the hierarchy is based on how you look. And that in and of itself is the, 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 the most insidious part of it. And that's the comp, that's the thing that I'm always sort of pulling at as I'm finding things, as I'm looking at things, is to try and see how all of that has played out over time. Um, the stories are, as I, as, as I sort of indicated, are there and they're complicated, but it's also that I have a deep affection for these material culture items. I'm just very much you know, drawn to, to the idea that some of these things have survived, whatever, where, whatever they may be. And, and um, as, I'm especially um, struck by the like very small fragments of things that um, are held onto by Black families that wind up in collections at various times. I've photographed, they're not part of this group of photographs because they're outside the 13 colonies, but there's a whole sewing box at the Nebraska State Historical Society called the um, Douglas Sewing Box. And the, it comes from a family whose matriarchs had, had, whose matriarch had been a runaway slave and had lived in the Frederick Douglass household. He and his wife helped raise her. She winds up married out in, and she brings all these mementos. There's lock, uh, more locks of Douglas's hair, but also the children and his, you know, all the members of the family. There are all kinds of other mementos inside this box that she's held on to and then passed down from one generation to another. And I don't know the full story of how it got to the collection, but at some point somebody, you know, wanted to preserve it. And that's, and that's a, another conversation, but, you know, the difficulty of of black archival institutions, archival institutions that are predominantly started and maintained by the black community have, you know, struggled so much um, at various periods of time for the funding. Um, and so we see in a case like that and in many others, you know, a sense that, you know, black families will feel like, you know, there may be a sense that these other institutions will, um, you know, have the resources that are necessary. Now, there certainly are, um, you know, wonderful uh, institutions that have resources. I just was visiting Atlanta uh, University Center, and, you know, there's a, 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 it's special collections, you know, feel like special collections anywhere um, in a university setting, in a library setting. Um, but I also had the experience also in Omaha of a, Black History Museum that had become had had been abandoned, and the roof had fallen in, and all this, all the stuff inside was getting damaged, and a range of different things. And so, you know, we have to strike a balance. I see more and more, you know, um, investment by you know black entrepreneurs, and I think that's wonderful in institutions that are designed to preserve that history. Um, but it certainly I, and I think that's the that's that's an important part. It goes back to the post-it, you know, that you yes. you came across. I mean, it it's yes. recognizing that and and the importance of that um, in in the community because of the difficulty of knowing whether or not the story will be told, of knowing whether or not the um, story will be understood, or whether the story will be valued um, in in the same way. And I think that's one of the things that hopefully that, um, you know, I'm looking for as I go out there as a way to value stories um, in, in different places. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wendell, you know, one, one of the things that what you just said um, occurred to me is that in some ways we're probably witnessing a bit of a, a renaissance period in the mm -hmm. preservation 
of uh, African American history and culture and certainly material culture. And some signals of that or signs of that is, you know, the recent um, reopening of the Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee, mm-hmm. um, you know, the erection of the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture, the mm-hmm. coming of the International African American mm-hmm. Museum in Charleston, South mm-hmm. Carolina. Mm-hmm. What, you know, what? Uh, you know, and, and your work is certainly part of this incredible momentum uh, mm-hmm. to preserve um, and espouse the, the history and culture. Mm-hmm. But, but what do you attribute to this, this almost, um, this momentum, this excitement in the preservation of right. culture, of, of Black culture in particular? Right. Well, I mean, I, th- I, do, I do think it was underway, but there's no doubt that the um, opening of the National Museum on the Mall had a tremendous, you know, that provided a tremendous boost. Lonnie Bunch was out there all over the country meeting with people, talking about whether or not their collection should come into the, you know, or meeting with individuals and saying, you know, your thing could be in this collection. And really, you know, all of what he was doing, I think, helped even for the people that didn't want their stuff to go there, help people to think, well, maybe I need to do something right here. And maybe we're, there are ways in which we can do other things. And I remember um, Clem Price, who was his friend of Lonnie Bunches, who's passed away and uh, who was really a wonderful scholar, you know, all was, was talking about that struggle in that he felt that this was an advance of the museum opening that the sort of old expression of, you know, all boats rising, you know, with the tide. And it was that, and I think that, you know, that probably has um, borne out to some extent, um, which is that, yes, there was some consolidation into one place, but at the same time, I think it helped, you know, um, incentivize independent projects even more so. People could point to that project and say, see, there people, not just that it was done and it was beautiful, but, you know, you can't get in. (laughs) So many people want to go. And so if we could do something on that level in our community, then we would have that same enthusiasm as well. And I think that, and we've we've also seen, you know, um, Brian Stevenson and, you know, the enthusiasm there and how many people, you know, trek to, um, to that museum as well as the installation. Uh, all of that has demonstrated a, um, you know, for lack of a better term, Black cultural tourism enthusiasm, but also just broadly, you know, and uh, the degree to which um, there's an appetite for understanding this story. I mean, this is back to, to Isabel Wilkerson's, it's, you can't just ignore the fact that there's water in the basement of the house. And then it's, you know, you've got to pay attention. And I think people recognize you've got to pay attention to all these flaws. And to the extent that it brings out flaws, and I was in a a workshop recently and somebody asked the question, you know, what kind of criticisms have you ever gotten with your work in general? And, you know, and certainly one of them has been that sometimes the things that are shown are painful. Sometimes the things, that I show are not um, things that you know everybody wants to look at or think about on both in in both the white community and the black community, but you can't you know leave the water in the basement and not expect the house to fall down. So we gotta we gotta look at it. Totally, and 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 on top of the pain um, that that is uh, you know tied to uh, black experiences and diasporic experiences. The idea of rescuing collections, mm-hmm. the idea of orphaned, orphaned black, um, you know, uh, memorabilia and um, material culture. I mean, in some ways, your work as a cultural worker and as a photographer and as a researcher and as a curator is about rescuing um, uh, black culture in some ways from the margins. Um, and that's pretty powerful. We have a ton of questions um, in our Q&A, and I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to, um, um, uh, for you to respond to some of the questions that our audience um, has. Um, many are asking questions with regards to your practice as a photographer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, 
Kit Loke, I think is, or KL, uh, asked the question, why are almost all the objects shot partially blurred? Right. So for that is, is directly connected to um, something that I said earlier, which is that I am really um, connecting to the object itself as an experience. And so one of the things that I don't want to do is um, to cross over into the illustration of the content. And so that's a way of photographing historical material. I've got, I've written an essay and I want to have a photograph of this thing that goes in my essay. And certainly there are uh, lots of different approaches and I do have some uh, approaches to images where I photograph objects and the whole thing is in focus. But one of the things that I've always talked about is the degree to which this is for me, been an experience of folding time, that I'm experiencing something that's coming to me out of the past, and it is this relationship, even if it is a relatively new object, a door from Katrina, or a very early object, a slave shackle, the sense that something from the past has now traveled through time to come to me, in a sense, in front of me in a collection is the kind of experience that I want to um, illuminate. I also want to uh, try and describe what it feels like. And so for me, this is just a way of describing what it feels like to encounter these objects. Wow. I think this uh, is going around a few times. I can stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Several, um, several of our other um, guests also asked um, about um, your angle and focus um, for mm -hmm. those images, which I think you illuminated. Um, right. Others um, wanted to also know, um, uh, had very specific questions. Dr. Quincy B, how do I, um, how do I assist Black families with early 1900 artifacts and possible enslaved persons? person's narratives in a way that assists them without being too pushy. Right, right, absolutely. So I think that is, um, you know, a huge question. And I, and I know that that was one of the concerns that um, Clem Price and Lonnie Bunch had as they were starting to build the connections for the museum. It is, you know, a very difficult uh, question. One of the things is, you know, of course, what resources does the family have to protect and preserve the materials. And if they don't have those resources, you know, are there ways, are there um, contracts that can be drawn up with institutions that would both honor the wishes of the family for whatever reason in relationship to access to the material and at the same time provide for an ongoing presence historically. Um, and that's that's always a, a tough a tough thing. I mean, you know, I sort of think I can take care of my stuff, but I probably can't um, in the long run. And so at some point, you know, in my life, I will have to think about, well, are there institutional, um, you know, uh, connections that I might make to deal with, you know, stuff that I have that is, you know, I mean, there's like one or two things that don't, you know, that won't go in the trash, but the things, those one or two things, you have to think, you know, can you, provide for them, you know, sort of in perpetuity. And that's the, the way in which such narrow narratives were told in this country, because, and not just excluding people of color, excluding all people who are not wealthy. So excluding people who are poor don't get their stories told either, because it was always something that could be done by the wealthy. You could create an ongoing trust that out of your own money that would take care of your stuff going forward to make sure your name was on something and that it was taken care of. And so if you spent a lot of time, you know, you know, constructing and, and furnishing a house in Newport and you wanted people to enjoy it, you know, into the future, you could do that with your own money if you were, you know, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's that distinction that is important to understand is that, yeah, there are people that are able uh, in the past and in the present that are able to use their own funds through a trust to, to do that sort of thing. But for the rest of us, it 
it is worth thinking about partnerships with institutions. Wendell, I, I, I think I kind of want to build on that question a little bit. You know, are, are there limitations within the historical enterprise as mm. well? You know, when I think about um, uh, black um, um, collectors, particularly um, those that are really preoccupied with familial records, mm. is, is, that a, is that a way to counter, for instance, the, the wall of 1877? You know, where we, we know that the documentation, those traditional um, pathways to, to sort of document um, Black lives gene through right. genealogy, that mm -hmm. Black people weren't documented in those traditional modalities of, right. you know, um, right. documentation. Right, right. I mean, our names didn't appear you know, as as enslaved people, you know, for the most part, there I've seen records where people's names appeared, and that's remarkable. And I'm sure for the families that are connected to that, I know in my own family, I've seen where it crosses into that period of time, and we make a pretty good guess as to you know that this particular record is pointing to, you know, my great grandfather and his brother at the point that they are children, um, and and enslaved, but their names are not there. We just have a range of, of circumstances, age and place and a range of other kinds of things that, that make it very likely. But um, yeah, we have a lot of that. And then coming forward, there are things in our family record, such as, you know, the family Bible that, you know, is still today is floating is in somehow one of my cousin's houses. You know, I don't know where it is, but it's not, you know, uh, accessible for other for other people to to look at for research. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, Denise, uh, Denise asks, can you talk about the artistic considerations you have while photographing these objects? You have a very particular style. Um, again, um, she uh, looks at blurring parts of the objects, taking them right. at at a very particular uh, angle. Are there any other uh, strategies, practices that guide uh, your, your eye and your practice as a photographer? So I certainly have a certain degree to which I have an affinity for the way in which cameras and lenses and optics intersect with the world. I've always, you know, and in all the different modalities, that I have photographed, it's always been about the notion that the camera tr interprets the world in a unique way. And there are lots of different unique ways that it interprets the world. And in this particular case, as in each of my projects, I try to find a modality that matches, you know, the sensibility of what I'm, I'm trying to convey in one way or the other. And in, in this particular case, it is, um, it is a little, there's a little bit of alchemy involved. I, I have to admit that it, I, I know what sort of things I have to bring to bear. Um, and I think I was sort of relating this before, but I don't always know if it will work. I don't know, you know, if it will, you know, generate the, the, the material that I that I'm hoping that it will generate because of the way, and it's a sort of a longer technical explanation, but the way that I put the image together is not, um, fully revealed until I'm, I'm editing the image uh, and, you know, looking at it, um, I look at it, I edit it on the computer. And so until it comes together on the computer, I don't know for sure. Did I get the angle just right? Is the depth of field just right? Is the, you know, the precise, you know, placement just right? Also, just to, as a, one small thing to tell everyone, all of these objects, everything, has been photographed under the available light in the collection. I do not bring any lights and or lighting to the process of photographing. So these every object has been photographed with the lighting that you would see if you just went in the collection and asked to pull that particular object. So it's pretty much always in a reading room. Every once in a while, they want me out of the way and I get it stuck in a conference room because I have a lot of stuff, but it's always in, you know, inside a room where, you know, I can be 
you know, monitored, but also just, you know, typically I'm just sitting out in the reading room. I mean, when I was at the QC library, I just had the tables at the end of the room and I was, had my stuff and, you know, they just sort of said, okay, you stay down at that end. The other researchers <laughs> will have plenty of room over here. And that was, that was the light that I, that I work with. And that's the light that I've, that I'm always working with everywhere I go and solving, you know, the unique problem that the light's always different, but everything that you see is, is the result of that. Wow. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, uh, North Carolina uh, Sites asks, thank you for this wonderful conversation. At the beginning of your talk, you spoke about how your work relates to the place of Black life and culture within the American landscape and land. Your title and focus on the 13 colonies give a sense of place but I was struck by the placelessness of the objects on their black velvet backdrops. Right. Beautiful question. I wondered if you have any thoughts about the relationship between your work and place, land, and landscape. Right, absolutely. And the for me, my answer for that is that I am in the process of building, in the process of creating this work, I'm creating my own place. I'm bringing those objects into my place that is apart from all of these um, specific parts of the landscape. But I always acknowledge, it's like a land acknowledgement, every title is, the, is some sort of description of the object based on the archive or collection, however it's described in the archive or collection. I just use the information out of the database or out of the finding aid and the name of the institution, the city and the state where that institution is located. So in the, the full experience is understanding where it sits in the world, what building it might sit in. You could sort of Google the exact location in the place in the world, but the work that I'm creating is to extract it in a sense and create my own landscape that it, it, that it sits within. And that's where a, a colleague of mine many years ago, uh -huh. you know, referenced the idea of a reliquary and I have stayed with very much that idea that I've I've been constructing a reliquary of all of these of, of all of these objects. I love that idea. Wendell, I think I uh, speak on behalf of all that have joined us this evening, and especially the Harvard Museum of Museums of Science and Culture, and my colleagues at the Peabody. We are so grateful for your genius and your brilliance, and for sharing uh, your work with us and to the world. And we look forward to hearing more from you and your work <laughs> in our galleries, <laughs> um, available to the to the public for for purchase as well. I did see one question about. Um, um, where can one find your uh, manifest uh, book? Oh, okay. So that we are working, that is a, a work in progress um, with this. And so we will, that will be uh, forthcoming. Um, but the uh, images from the pro earlier images from the project are um, on display at various times in different places. The next um, exhibition will be at the National Underground uh, Railroad um, uh, Foundation Center in uh, is, is that Cincinnati? Cincinnati, um, as part of a photo festival starting in September. So there'll be uh, a group. Actually, those pictures right behind me, <laughs> those will be uh, on this. That that exact display will be uh, post. Will be up in the center as part of a, a, a larger festival, biennial festival of photographs um, uh, that will be up there. So for any of the Ohio folks that or folks that will be traveling there, uh, it'll be up from, I think it's September to March. It's up for a long time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and talk, and we look forward to, to seeing you soon. Uh, at any rate, to our audience, thank you for being such a captive audience. If you're interested in more programs uh, sponsored by and presented by the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, please feel free to visit us at our website at www.hmsc.harvard.edu. Take care.